me, but uh, um, I, I had shared something with the church there that I just wanted to highlight a little bit uh, to you today. It was something the Lord was ministering to me uh, regarding the uh, um, bringing the Ark of the Covenant uh, back back into the presence of uh, of Israel. And I want to just share this uh, scripture with you from chapter 13 of First Chronicles. It says, And uh, David consulted with the captains of thousands and hundreds and with every leader. And David said unto all the congregation of Israel, If it seem good unto you, and that it be of the Lord our God, let us send abroad unto our brethren everywhere that are left in the land of Israel, and with them also to the priests and Levites which are in their cities and suburbs, that they may gather themselves unto us. And let us bring again the ark of our God to us, for we inquired not at it in the days of Saul. And so basically, what David is saying here, and I, again, I'm just going to highlight this because I, I'm um, going a little bit of a different direction this morning than I did last Sunday, is the, uh, is the fact that David wanted God's presence in their midst. He wanted uh, that ark of the covenant represented God's immediate personal presence. And so it was a very good thing for David and all of Israel to want God's presence in their midst. Amen? And it says we need to bring this back because in the days of Saul, we have sort of departed from that. We, we haven't inquired of that. And we want God's presence to be back in our midst. And, and so I just, I just want you to see the parallel here is, is, is that a, a turning over a or, or making a, a rededication of our lives to get back to where God wants us to be and to do the thing God, God wants us to be. And that's where David's heart was. And uh, uh, just jumping ahead, they started to bring the ark back. And uh, uh, there was all kinds of uh, a jubilation going on. David was dancing before the ark. They were playing before the ark with all, all manner of music. Uh, they, were they were so happy to the fact that they... They were bringing God's presence back into their midst. And uh, uh, while they were bringing the ark uh, back on the cart, uh, it, uh, it hit, a, it hit a, um, a bump in the road, and the oxen stumbled, and, uh, and the ark was shaken. And uh, Uzzah, who was helping to uh, move the ark, reached up to stabilize it. How many of you remember reading this? He reached up to stabilize it, and immediately as he reached up and touched the ark, God killed it. To the extent that this time of excitement of bringing God's presence back into their midst, and all of the music stopped, and David stopped his dancing, and, and all of a sudden they were fearful. They were fearful because uh, this, this uh, and, and, and somewhat bewildered, at this particular point because here we are we want to do a good thing we want to bring God's presence back into our midst and all of a sudden he just reached up to Uzzah just reached up to stabilize the ark and God killed it and so it says that the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah and he smote him because he put his hand to the ark and there he died before God and David it said was displeased he, he, was, he was not only dis, displeased I don't think summarizes his whole attitude at this point he was he was he was confused he was frustrated he was he was at this point of uh, just we wanted to do a good thing and yet a bad thing has come about because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah in that place and it says in verse 12 of the 13th chapter and it says and David was afraid of God that day and he wouldn't bring the ark back. He said, uh, how shall I bring the ark of God home to me? So David brought not the ark home to himself, but set it aside. In the 15th chapter, Dave, David learned a lesson. And uh, I just, just want to uh, continue on here. Verse 2 of the 15th chapter of 1 Chronicles says, And David said, 
None ought to carry the ark of God but the Levites, for them hath the Lord chosen to carry the ark of God and to minister unto him forever. And David gathered all Israel together to Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the Lord into its place, which he had prepared for it. So he had just done this um, a while back and had done it in such a way that God and his standards were violated and Uzzah was killed. Now David recognizes the fact it wasn't God's fault, it was our fault. We didn't come in line with God's way of doing this. And so in the 15th chapter, David is basically saying, we need God's presence in our life, and for God's presence in our life, we need to do it God's way. And we need to follow God's way of bringing the ark back. And uh, as you read the 15th chapter, which I'm not going to do, um, you will, you will discover that they successfully bring the ark back, again, with jubilation, with excitement, with singing, with dancing, over God's presence being back. But they had sanctified, the Levites had sanctified themselves, and they were, they were carrying the ark the way that had, it had been commissioned by God to be moved and brought into their midst. And I just brought this out at Scripture last Sunday, and I want to bring it out to you, is the parallel in our lives. We want to do good things. And, and sometimes we do those good things our way instead of God's way. And we, instead of experience the goodness that we desire, we experience the consequences associated with our violation. Um, a few examples, or one example I'll just bring to your attention, would be the raising of children. I want my children to be functional, to be, to be healthy, and to live successful lives. Is there any parent that doesn't? But sometimes in our desire to see that happen, we reach up and we steady the ark in an unsanctified way. We begin to do those things and in, in to establish our children and our desires for them to be who we believe they want them to be, we, be, we begin to raise them our way instead of the way that God has told us to. And what happens is, is in our best efforts, and I really believe, I can, I can portray this in my own life, um, my parents, my, my parents put forth a whole lot of effort for us, for us, my brother and my sister and I, to be functional adults, to grow up and to learn the, the principles uh, of God. I mean, we, we had to go to Sunday school, and they took us to church. But you know what? There were some things there in their lives as they tried to raise us up. It, they did not practice training us up in the ways of the Lord. They, they practiced good things. They wanted good things in our life. And just like, just like David and the Israelites, they wanted a good thing. But as soon as they decided to do it their way instead of God's way, there were consequences associated with it. Amen? Are you hearing? And, and there are times when we need to recognize that the ways that the world are telling us to do things or the way that our culture is telling us to do things are not the ways of God. And we are reaching up and steadying the ark and we are experienced consequences associated with that. It can apply to all a uh, multitude of areas. But I really believe that this illustration is given to us not just to show the reverence that needs to be shown for God's presence, but the obedience that needs to be shown even when we desire a good thing to occur in our lives. Amen? Um, we see this uh, portrayed... In, in many, many ways throughout Scripture. Many, many, many ways throughout Scripture. And I, I, we see it portrayed today graphically in humanity, even, even humanity in the church. Where, And I'm not just talking about raising children. I was using that as an example. But where we are desiring a good thing. It's, it's for example, another example is uh, um, we desire an individual to, uh, uh, to be saved. We desire to have a, a good husband or a good good wife that is living for the Lord, and, and we're living for the Lord, and we, 
we want this individual that we're dating or that we're seeing to come to the Lord. So what we're going to do is we're going to marry that individual because it's a good thing to be married, isn't it? Anybody say yes? Amen. It's a good it's a good thing to be married, and so we're we're going we're going to we're going to uh, we're going to be married to this individual. It's a good thing for me to have a spouse. Well, all of a sudden that we recognize is that we reached up to steady the steady the ark as Uzzah did because we are being unequally yoked together with unbelievers, and instead of living in heaven, we we get a taste of hell. Anybody know what I'm talking about? But it, it applies to a whole lot of different things throughout this. But I, I, I really want us to just be aware that it's not just desiring a good thing. It's desiring a good thing and acquiring a good thing God's way. Amen? It's desiring a good thing but acquiring a good thing God's way. Now, where I want to go this morning or, or focus predominantly this morning is putting God and his kingdom first. You know, in Matthew 6, 33, most of you are familiar with this, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus made that statement, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added unto you. And basically what he's talking about there is, is that if you will seek God first, God will take care of you. God will take care of you. But the key is that you need to seek God first. Now, of course, he's going to take care of us, but the main emphasis is the fact that he wants us to seek him first. He wants us to seek him first above and beyond everything. And recognizing the fact that as we are seeking him first and doing his will above and beyond anything that our ideas or plans may include, God is going to bring into our lives those things that we need those desires in our lives. It, you know, it goes right along in Scripture where it says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will bring you the desires of your heart. Amen? Everybody understand that? Um, and I want to, uh, if, you, if you have your Bibles, you'd like to turn there. I'm going to be in Second Chronicles. And in 16th chapter. And there was a king in the 16th chapter called Asa. And it says in the 6th, uh, starting at the first verse there of the 16th chapter, it says in the 6th and 30th year of the reign of Asa, Basha, king of Israel, came against Judah and built Ramah to the intent that he might let none go out or come in to Asa, king of Judah. Then Asa brought out silver and gold out of the treasures of the house of the Lord and and first of all, I want you to see what he did. He brought out the silver and gold out of the treasures of the house of the Lord. So he, he went into God's house and took the silver and gold out of it. Okay? And he sent to Ben-Hadid, king of Syria, that dwelt at Damascus, saying, There is a league between me and thee, as there was between my father and thy father. Behold, I have sent thee silver and gold. Go and break thy league with Basha, king of Israel, that he may depart from me. And Ben Hadid hearkened unto King Asa and sent the captains of his armies against the cities of Israel, and they smote Ijon and Dan and Abibliam and all the store cities of Naphtali. And it came to pass when Basha heard it that he left off building of Ramah and let his work cease. Then Asa the king took all Judah and they carried away the stones of Ramah and the timber thereof wherewith Basha was building, and he built therewith Geba and Mizpah. And at that time, Hanani, the seer, came to Asa, king of Judah, and said unto him, Because thou hast relied on the king of Syria, and not relied on the Lord thy God. Everybody see that? Therefore is the host of the kings of Syria, of Syria escaped out of thine hand. Were not the Ethiopians and the Lubims a huge host, with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because thou didst rely on the Lord, he delivered them into thine hand. And now here's a here's a key verse. If you highlight or underline, this is a great one to highlight or underline. Verse 9. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. 
Herein thou hast done foolishly, therefore from henceforth thou shalt have wars. Then Asa was wroth with the seer, put him in prison house, for he was in a rage with him because of this thing. And Asa oppressed some of the people at the same time, and behold the acts of Asa, first and last, they are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. I want you to see, and I really believe, once again, God is painting a picture that's pretty similar to the situation with Uzzah as well, is the fact that he wants us not to try to do things our way or to figure out a way for our success. He wants us to be obedient. He wants us to be submissive to him, recognizing the fact that success is going to come through obedience. It's not going to become, it's not going to come for us trying to figure out a way of success that violates our submission and obedience to God and his system and standard. Asa was facing a problem. We all face problems. We all face difficulties in our life. And I, I'm sure if we were to, if I were to ask you to raise your hand if you're dealing with a particular problem right now or an issue right now, uh, we would see, we wouldn't see very many hands left down unless you were lying. <laughs> we, we, we all have issues, and some of them may be more major than others, but we all have issues. We all have problems in our life. But what, when facing this problem, Asa was willing to violate God's system for his own success. And what he did is he actually went into the house of the Lord, he took the gold and the silver out of the Lord, and he went to a pagan nation, the nation of Syria, and he hired the nation of Syria to go against Basha because Basha was his problem. And you know what happened? He was successful. Basha, all of a sudden, Basha, who was a threat, and he had this problem in his life, and it was coming after him, all of a sudden, because he went into the temple of, of the Lord, he took the silver and gold, and he gave it to the king of Syria. Syria came against Basha. Basha, Basha left, and they were able to uh, tear down the, uh, 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 the, the various buildings that they were building as a, for siege against, uh, uh, against Asa, and they... And they, uh, they pretty much just salvaged all of those things and tore them all down and it seemed like all was well. So it was just like uh, at this particular point uh, uh, Asa's thinking, I want you to stay with me on this, I hope I'm not confusing you. Asa's pretty much thinking, thinking along these lines, well hey it worked. That's all I needed to do. Boy wasn't that a great idea. And, and, but Hanani comes to him and, and Hanani's a prophet and he says you know what? You didn't trust in God. You didn't trust in doing this God's way. God has already shown you that he was able to, to conquer the Ethiopians and the Lubims on your behalf. And they were great multitudes. But you didn't trust in God. You trusted in Syria. You trusted in your own ingenuity. And because of that, you are going to have, even though it looked like you have experienced success, you are going to have problems. You are going to have war. You are, you are going to have unrest in your life. And uh, um, it says that uh, Asa got aggravated. He got aggravated uh, with the person who told him the truth to the extent that he, uh, he threw him in a prison house. And, and, and he began to be oppressive to some of the people at this particular time. And all he did is he got told the truth. Now, I, 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 I really believe that we need to see God's truth to us in this. Once again, just like David and Israel learned, is the fact that they, they, had a, they desired a good thing, and that was to bring God's presence back into their midst, but they violated that by doing it their way. Um, we recognize that. There's, there's times we want God... God's presence to be in our house. We want God's presence to be in our finances. We want God's blessing to be in our relationships. We want all of these blessings of God, and we try to facilitate those many times in our own way, and we experience consequences instead of blessings. In Asa's particular case, he was facing a problem. It wasn't just a desire 
for benefit. It was facing a problem, and he wanted to address this problem, but he didn't address this problem with God. He addressed this problem in violation of faithfulness to God. Does everybody see that? Now, the, the point here is, is that he experienced success initially, and it appeared as if this worked on his behalf. Now, we see this happening a lot in our lives today. We see the initial success of doing things our own way as a victory, never realizing the long-term consequences associated with our violation of God's system. And just as Asa had received the victory over Basha because of his integration with the Syrians, God's the consequences of violating God's system was placed upon Asa and his kingdom. And they were going to have unrest or war in their life. Um, how many of you today believe that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills? How many of you today believe that God has resources that are far beyond any economic system or failure of any economic system and that God takes care of his own? How many of you today believe that no matter what's going on in our economy, that Matthew 6.33 is still true? How many of you believe today that if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all things shall be added unto you? In, in other words, God's going to take care of you. And yet, in knowing that, in believing that truth and having awareness of that truth, many times when facing problems, we're, we're going into the storehouse of God's temple and giving the money to the Syrians to come on our behalf. Because we are so fearful, we are so frustrated, we are so afraid that we're not going to be able to meet our financial needs or we're going to have this consequence or this in our life. We need to do this, we need to be involved. And, uh, and initially it looks as if we've experienced a degree of success. But then there's consequences associated with that violation. How many of you today believe that there's, we serve a God of healing? How many of, you ser how many of you believe today that Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace, the same yesterday, today, and forever? How many of you today believe that just as Jesus Christ said to the, said to the uh, raging sea, peace be still, he can say to that raging sea within your emotions and within your mind, peace be still, and it will be still. We still serve a God of power, and yet so many times, we believe that running to the medicine closet or, or buying drugs on the street or drinking a, a, a bottle of alcohol is going to bring us the, the, that peace that we desire in our lives. And it seems as though it works. At least initially, it seems as though that all of a sudden, this unrest, this problem I was facing, these difficulties I, I was facing, all of a sudden, I'm able to cope. All of a sudden, the, 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 the raging waves have been stilled. And all of a sudden, I have this, this level of peace in my life. And it, it seems to be the answer. But I, I really believe we need to hear Hanani. Where he's basically saying, wait a second, isn't the God that you believe in big enough? to calm the raging sea in your life? Isn't God big enough to restore that situation in your marriage? Isn't God big enough to meet your financial needs to the extent that you need to be obedient and submissive and seek His kingdom first and He will supply? I've seen many today, uh, people today that say, you know what, and, and again, it's for our benefit, it's for your benefit, it's not necessarily for God's. He, he doesn't need any of your resources. Uh, you don't make God any richer than he is. Um, but he, he, he's integrated the principle of tithing into his system. And basically it's a, it's a, it's a system of faith. It's, it's, the, it's the faith that declares, I know this is from you, and because of that I'm going to put you first. And in putting you first, I recognize your promises are going to be true. Amen? That you are going to open up the windows of heaven and that you are going to, you're going to rebuke the devourer for my sake and that you are going to pour out a blessing. 
Anybody believe that today? We believe that today. Now, I'll tell you what, unless, of course, we are strapped with some serious financial issues. All of a sudden, we discover, wait a second, I was expecting a return, and the tax people come back and say, you owe. Instead of you're going to get, they come back to you, you owe. Or all of a sudden, you're finding out that there is a financial crisis going on, or there's a situation. How many of you have discovered these things surface when you least expect them? And uh, we have these financial difficulties or these crises in our life, and at that point, we call the Syrians. At that point, we're saying, yes, I need to get out of this financial crisis. I know, God, I know it's your will for me to get out of this financial crisis. I know you want my family stable. I know you don't want me hurting. I know you don't want me under this stress. I need to call the Syrians to deliver me from this. And all of a sudden, we recognize that there's a, there's a degree of success because we have, we've had that apparent extra money because we haven't been tithing or giving that the, way, the way that we knew that the Lord had wanted us to because of our financial crisis. And it seemed like our short-term solution, a short-term solution, but our short-term solution becomes a long-term problem. As we, we did it our way instead of God's way. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the land. Throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Herein thou hast done foolishly. Therefore from henceforth thou shalt have wars. It applies to so many different things. But I, you know, as, as, so many times when we're facing the difficulties or problems of life, we forsake the truth that we know is true is there before us. We, we, we forsake the God that we know is able and we work on a solution our way instead of God's way, instead of God's ways. And this was Asa's difficulty and problem. And in fact, Hanani was sent to him to bring it to his attention. He says, you know what? Sure, you had a problem. He wasn't denying the fact that Basha was a problem in Asa's life. He wasn't, he wasn't denying the fact that this was a, a very difficult situation. But he said, you know what? You sought Syria instead of God. And God needs to be first and foremost, and he needs to be your answer. He is the one that you need to go to. He is the, it's his way that you need to follow. Seeking first his kingdom means putting his ways above and beyond your ways, this world's ways. Amen? Now, Asa went through this crisis. He was... Uh, if you read about Asa, it says he was a good king. Uh, he had some, here, but these are some of his uh, bad episodes. Um, he didn't learn from this. Even though he had this, these wars and unrest, because it goes on in the same chapter, and it says in the 39th year of his reign, he was diseased in his feet. Until his disease was exceedingly great. And so he, and he, he basically had this disease in his feet for two years. Because in the 13th fact, uh, verse, it says uh, he died in the uh, 41st year. So he got this in, a, in his 39th year, and, and then in the 41st year he died. But it says there in the 12th verse, it says, Yet in his disease he sought not the Lord, but to the physicians. Everybody see that? What Asa didn't learn was the fact that God is able to heal your body. What is being portrayed here in Second Chronicles is the fact that God could have healed his diseased feet. How many of you believe that? But instead of being healed of his diseased feet, he died in two years. And it seemed as though that he had the, he had the solution. And the solution was, I will just seek the physicians because of my con condition. I will just seek the physicians. They will be my cure. And he may have had, I don't know, they may have medicated him, they may have given him a temporary cure, but he died two years later. And it's recorded in Scripture because God wants us to see this. 
it's recorded in scripture that he sought the physicians instead of the Lord. Everybody see that? I'm not making this up. My goal is to appropriate this. It's to understand God's truth so that it can be appropriated in my life and to portray that truth so that you can appropriate it in your life as well. I, seen, I saw this with Uzzah. It was a good thing, but they were doing it their way instead of God's way, and instead of blessing, they got consequences. I saw this with Asa when Basha was coming against him. Uh, he hired the Syrians, and the Syrians, which he thought was his cure, eventually became his problem. I deal with that. I've dealt with that for 25 years, approximately. The fact of, of individuals that have sought a cure that weren't, you know, you know why drugs are so popular? You know, you know why drugs are so epidemic in our land? Because they work. They do what they say they're going to do. They get you high. And there's a whole lot of people that are miserable and they need to get high. Because they, they're sick of living low. Amen? I mean, this, this, this is not real deep or profound. It's just the fact of the matter. And, and drugs work. They get you high. They lift you. They lift, they lift your feelings. They lift your emotions. They make you feel better. Alcohol. What does it do? It gets you high. It lifts you up. It gives you, it gives you a little break from the, from the condition that you're in. And it seems, as though, it seems as though that it's a cure that works, that you're delivered, that, the, that the, the, the strongholds of Basha have been pulled down. And all of a sudden, yeah, now I feel better about myself. But all of a sudden, they, they, they recognize. And uh, I, you know, I, pick, I, I share on Joe Johnson all the time. He's usually here when the rest of the guys leave. But uh, uh, Joe, Joe Johnson, it worked. Crack cocaine, it worked. It got him high. But then he had war in his life for the next eight years. All of a sudden, what he used to bring him peace became his bondage and became his problem. What we need to recognize is, is that there are good things available. God does want you to get high. God does want you to be lifted up. God does want you to be happy. He recognizes that the joy of the Lord is going to be your strength. He desires to come before his presence with singing and with joyfulness and make a joyful noise on the Lord. God desires us to be happy, to be content. But there's only one way to get it that is going to be of substance, not just a temporary fix, but a substance in our lives that's going to be perpetual, and that's his way in God's strength. Amen? Um, that's why... To those that really experience the reality of God, particularly through the baptism in his Holy Spirit, all of a sudden recognize the fact that any kind of high that crack cocaine would give them would be a whole lot lower than the high they're already on. Because they've been lifted up. God is, they've been doing, they did it God's way. Be not drunk with wine, which is shallow, but be filled with the Spirit, which is abundant. Amen? Being drunk with wine is a temporary man fix. But being filled with the Spirit is a perpetual God fix. Does everybody see that? I really believe that it, he's painting this picture for us. And I, I, there's some that say, you know what? You know, it's, it's 2013, and you know what? God just don't heal today like he used to heal today. I'm going to say... It's not God who changed. Because he said, I am the Lord thy God, I change not. So he's the same God of healing today as he was yesterday. God does the same things today that he did yesterday. Anybody believe that? God is still a God of the miraculous. God that parted the Red Sea is still the same God today. God that raised to life the dead is still the same God today. God that healed the leper is still the same God today. So if God hasn't changed, then it may, it goes 
my perspective, which may be uh, very simple, if God hasn't changed, then what has? And it's me and it's you that has changed. We've gotten too smart in our own wisdom. Humanity has gotten too smart in their own wisdom where they start, well, all we need to do is call the Syrians. And all we need to do is study this. And all we need to do is do this God, do this our way and not God's way. And you know what? We're not experiencing the blessings that are associated with our submission and obedience to God's system. I really believe that God wants to heal bodies today. But I really believe that too often we've run to the physicians instead of the Lord. I really believe that God wants to deliver you from your problems. But too often, we have sought deliverance our way instead of God's way. And it's time. I really believe it's time for us as the church to come back to the truths of God and experience the power and the presence of God in our lives right now, right where we're at. But it's going to take a revival. It's going to, we need to be revived. We need to come back to the point, you know, uh, you remember when uh, Josiah was king, those of you that, are, that have uh, uh, been reading through the, the scriptures, you probably come across the pack when, part when Josiah was king, and what, the, what happened is, is that they discovered, he was a godly king, he desired to do what was right, and yet they discovered the law, the books of the law, and they came and read it to the king to the, to the point that even after he read it, he ripped his shirt, and he, and he, and he, uh, humbled himself before God because of the fact that, you know what? We've been trying to do a good thing. We've been trying to honor God, but we've been doing it our way and not God's way. And because of that, we haven't been living in the blessings of God. We've desired the blessings of God, but we haven't been living in the blessings of God because we've been doing it our way instead of God's way. And it was at that point that... Um, you know, it was revealed to them. There are consequences associated with this. Even though you have a heart after God, even though you desire his presence, even though you didn't even, weren't even aware of this at this point in time, there are consequences associated with you doing it your way instead of God's way. And it was upon all, the whole land. And so it was at the point where there was repentance, unified repentance that took place in the land at the discovery of the law. How many of you, how many of you ever read that? That is something we need today. There's something going on in the United States of America in the church that isn't really healthy. And it seems as though that the church has become more and more secularized. That we have, we have adopted the ways of the land, the culture of the land, the ideas of the land, the system of the land, where there are, in other nations, a simplicity and a recognition to the fact that there is a God that is still, that still does what he says he's going to do, and there's bodies being healed, and there's miracles taking place, and it's common, and these things, these things are just expected because that's what God does, and they've received it by faith, but we become so sophisticated and complicated trying to figure things out our way instead of fully relying and trusting on just submitting to God's way that our temporary blessings are short-lived and we're constantly trying to figure out a new way to solve our problems. I really believe that we serve a God that is the same yesterday, will be the same today, and forever. We, we have to come back to him his way. We need to believe that he is, and we need to acknowledge the fact that he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. But in doing so, it's going to, it's going to imply faith. It's going to imply taking a step that goes against the system 
that goes against the culture, that goes against the status quo, that simply says, you know what, I'm not going to do it that way because I believe in doing it that way, I'm going to be violating God's system. I'm going to submit to God's system and I'm going to be obedient to it. And uh, I'll tell you, we need some Shadrach, Meshachs, and Abednego that are simply going to say this, I'm going to submit to God's system and because God is able to heal me, God is able to solve my problem, and even if he doesn't, I'm still going to be obedient to his system. I am still going to be obedient to God no matter what happens because being in obedience to God is of my first and foremost importance in my life more so than the temporary blessings of this world. I don't know where you're at today, but I, I, I see us all falling into this. I see, I see this uh, in, integration into the, into the whole uh, um, church community of of the secularization of, of trying to just uh, do things the, the world's way, trying to figure everything out, trying to solve things, and, and looking, uh, looking for what makes the most sense. Or, you know, what, what equation seems to, seems to add up the best when, it's simply, when, when God has simply said, you know what you need to do is you, you need to throw all that away and start just trusting me. Just be obedient to me. Just, just do what I tell you to do. Just seek me first, and I will take care of you. And he goes about searching for those that he can show himself strong on their behalf. And I believe that might be you. I believe that might be you. Um, there's a, a scripture in Hebrews that says that uh, Esau desired repentance to the extent that he sought it with tears. How many of you are familiar with that? He sought it with tears, and yet he couldn't find it. He couldn't find it. He wanted it. It was a good thing. But he was looking for it his way instead of God's way. There's, there's all kinds of things that we seek and we desire. And they might be good things, but if we're looking for them our way instead of God's way, they're eventually going to leave us empty, if certainly shallow. But God wants us to be full 